Welcome, Hop Nation, to the Hop Nation podcast. Uh, I'm very happy to have with me today Jeff Chan from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Welcome this morning or Hi. afternoon. It's afternoon, yeah. Glad to be here. Thanks, Corey. So, Jeff, uh, you know, rather than read out a bio, I'd love to hear a bit about your founder's story and your motivation for being in the coaching and consulting business and the path that you got here, right? Because I find your path is an interesting one where you've been able to bring all these different worlds together. Yeah, thank, thanks. I'm ha- happy to share that. Um, and, and, you know, for the listeners, I, I'll i start off with a bit of, you know, from, from way back, but I trust me, it won't be that long. So it's not going to be too, too big a too long a walk down uh, memory lane, but uh, I'd say a couple of things. The first is um, as a teenager, um, I, th- I was always involved in my local church, United Church of Canada, which is a, a pretty liberal Protestant church in Canada. And, um, and I think because of that, I always had a sense that, you know, whatever you do in the world, you need to uh, do with some sense of purpose. And so, um, you know, during high school, I was very focused on uh, entrepreneurial endeavors, uh, going, uh, you know, reading business books. I was accepted into a university business program. Um, and, and through a, a, you know, a whole discernment process, I guess, at that time, Corey, I decided I was not going to go into business. I was going to sort of pursue a path of the human sciences or social sciences and go into United Church ministry, um, which means, you know, um, you know, a degree and then a master's degree. And, and at that time in my life, though, it very much felt like, you um, it was an either or choice, either, you know, you kind of go down this purpose filled path or you go down the business path. And I saw these as very distinct and separate, separate choices. Um, and so I did that, right. I, um, I went and I, I became a, a minister in the United Church of Canada and, and was working in, in churches. Uh, while I was there, I had a strong interest in psychology and counseling as well. So I did a master's in education and counseling psychology sort of set you up to go on a path to become a chartered psychologist. And, and part of my, my path was I moved to Bermuda and I was working in a church there. And, uh, you know, in about my 10th year was, was starting to get a little, um, you know, frustrated with some of the, what I, the politics um, I was seeing, I think um, I was always bringing business acumen to, to not only the church, but other not for profits, I think pushing them to, to think about sustainable revenue and, and what's your product and brand and, and those sorts of things. That's not enough just to have a great uh, mission or, or what have you. And, um, you know, I came, I came to a point where um, I started to do some work for the Arbinger Institute, which is a, an international organizational management consulting practice and did a little bit of consulting into the reinsurance industry and, and got to a point where I said, look, I got I don't want to be 75 and, saying I never tried this and never went out and created my own thing. So um, I left professional ministry at that point and, and moved back to Canada, you know, went to Ikea to set up an office and, uh, you know, buy some <laughs> furniture and away we went. So I, I started Arbinger Canada and uh, Arbinger Bermuda and uh, now has jumped right into sort of the, the small and medium and then corporate businesses in terms of consulting. And, um, it, and, and along the way, did some executive education as well at Tuck and, and Harvard, just sort of week-long intensives and those sorts of things. So um, I ended up in the, yeah, building this sort of organizational practice, uh, which not an uncommon story, uh, led me to a uh, sort of my first corporate job as a, the vice president of what we call organizational performance and human resources for an international oil company. Um, which then allowed me really, I guess, to, uh, to sink my teeth into some of the things that, that I've been teaching and the realities of managing sort of a publicly traded company. And I wasn't, man- I was part of the management, I should say. Um, Applying it in a deep dive practical way. Yeah. And you know, you, you can't say, you can't say you didn't do it then, right? The, the common thing yeah. that you get pushed back on as consultants and, and so, you know, but what I discovered right in the corporate world um, is um, I was playing a strong role a lot of the times really in coaching and, and dealing with things, just let's call it around the human condition. And, and really found that a lot of people are just ill-equipped. Um, we, we don't emphasize it. We don't 
put a lot of importance on it. Uh, a lot of the things that I had been trained in. And so that was another sort of turning point, right? Um, and so I really had my feet kind of in two different worlds. Um, and I know that for some people, they, they have a hard time imagining that, but I don't, I don't really see them that separate because I think you need both. And I'll, I'll always joke with people. I'll say, look, I've met some, some just wonderful purpose-driven, caring, compassionate people in the church. And I've met some real jerks too. And I'll say the same in business. I've met some of the, the best human beings I've ever known in business and I've met some real jerks. So the uh, point is, um, you know, with my organization practice now, it's, it's that we do need both in terms of blending um, sort of the, what I call the business science or the, the profit productivity sides of our business uh, with, with intention or purpose um, and people. And, uh, and that's kind of led me to where, where I am, I guess, uh, guess today, if that, that summarizes or answers your question. I, that's excellent. And I love how you have brought those worlds together. And, um, I'm, I really wanted to get you as one of the first guests, Jeff, because we have some similar stories. I, I think I've shared with you, I spent time leading ministry and mm -hmm. trying to be the, uh, the business or leadership mind in house and leading youth and children's ministry primarily, but also a men's ministry and business ministry. So I get that side, but that, that deep sense of purpose that comes with that sort of work. Um, because as you know, it's certainly not about the money. <laughs> no. Um, and it, it has its own, its own inherent problems, you know, one being absolutely that it, in, in sort of not-for-profit or let's, you know, service organizations just generally um, because they're about good work and, and sort of literally preaching compassion and care at times that they, they're resistant to make very strategic business decisions around human resources and people, et cetera, because uh, they don't want to be seen as being, you know, tough or, or hard. And, right. uh, and then I, I think you get the flip in the business world a little bit sometimes too. Right. And I think there's, you know, I, 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 you know, part of my tag is bring your humanity to work, you know? Um, mm. Good saying. Yeah. Great. There's this, there's something that happens. It's like the security at, at the airport, right? When you walk through the machine, you walk through the front corporate doors and suddenly, you know, business speak and professionalism, you know, maybe your heart gets a little smaller and you're just supposed to focus on just metrics results and driving and, you know, yeah. and at, at night complain about it. Right. And uh, we're, as human beings, one of the things that makes us unique is that we need to be in relationship with each other, right? And so when a, when a coworker is hurting or, or, or having even crisis in, in their personal life, I think there's lots of times that we, uh, we feel compelled and want to, to reach out. Yeah. Well, and I was talking with a buddy in Silicon Valley not that long ago where, I mean, big data, AI, you know, metrics or, you know, there's business and then there's, Silicon Valley, you know, that sort of mindset. And it's interesting how in that conversation, I, I said, you know, at the end of the day, we want information and data, you know, to make better informed decisions. So those are all good. But at the end of the day, behind all of that right. is people. And we can't forget about that. And I, you know, I don't know, I, something with acronyms and apparently I like, you know, three letter ones. I have HOP and I came up with this idea of HOT, the humanization of technology where, you know, it's good to use it as a tool, but it's only a tool. Like all those metrics that we traditionally use in business and in the corporate setting, those are great. They're tools in the toolbox, but we also need to pay attention to the people side, like you're saying, because without that, none of the rest matters. Not only that, if you only make it about, or if you take the human out of it, you then play the commodity game. You are a commodity and every product or service can be commodified. And if you don't make it about the people, you're going to fall into the commodity spiral. So yeah, I think that we, people who get pushback, yeah, we've created a hierarchy, right? And, um, it, you know, even within organizations, 
um, <clears throat> if you're on the technical or operational or, or sales side of the business, that, that's higher up in a hierarchy than if you're on the service side. And this, it's just a, it's just a myth um, that we continue, I think, to perpetuate. Um, we, we play a lot of lip service generally, right, to people are our biggest assets and, you know, we've got a great culture, but, you know, the rubber hits the road when, <clears throat> you know, when you talk to your frontline workers or, or, or even your customers, right? And so I think there's a lot of fear about what it means to, um, to genuinely care about the people that you work with or your customers. And I talk about this with clients and we unpack the, the fear and the benefits around that. And, you know, caring about each other at work doesn't mean we're, we're, you know, going camping on the weekend and drinking beers together, right? I mean, <clears throat> it, it, it means genuinely interested um, in their success and their development, um, in their frustrations and their challenges, and that I'm finding ways to, to examine on myself in terms of how I'm impacting that. So am I making their day better or worse? by my actions and where are the places that I can actually help and and what we've forgotten I think is that um, our influence with people in all of our life but we're talking about at work <clears throat> is not at a skill level it's not at, at me uh, you know speaking differently to you it's not at me being really polished um, it's whether I care about you and if I care about you you respond um, I think all of us can think of you know hockey coaches or teachers or people in our lives and we've had many of them <clears throat> and the ones that stick out the ones that we worked hard for the ones that we didn't want to you know fail are the ones that we know and they may never have said it but but it kind of oozes out of you uh we know they just cared about us right um oh spot on spot on jeff and you know to feed into the the metric uh, the metrics everyone wants to say there are metrics on this Absolutely. I don't think you should have to have metrics in order to, to invite somebody to genuinely care and develop their people. Uh, but, you know, um, organizations where employees feel they are generally cared for uh, have, you know, a 16 to 18% increase in profitability, 30 to 40% increase in productivity. So it's actually good business sense to be human to each other. I mean, that's, that's how I would, I would phrase it, I think. Absolutely. Well, and there's lots of businesses that show those that shine. I mean, Jim Collins' work, mm -hmm. you know, that does longitudinal studies of publicly traded companies and that and shows the impact. And that's been known for a sustainable advantage, mm -hmm. you know, so it's yeah. not just <laughs> you and I feeling and knowing this. It, it's out there. Now, speaking of influences, you're an influencer now, and I, I love that, but who were some of those um, people that inspired you or that were great influencers in your life that, you know, you want, that were great models that put you on the path? Mm. Yeah, <clears throat> it's a great question, right? Because I think... It's a little bit like, you know, my library of books. You know, if you look over your library, <clears throat> there's, there's some books I can't believe I was into or bought or read, but they had a point, there's a reason for them at a particular point in time. For sure. Um, you know, there was, you know, if I sort of parallel this a little bit with the story I shared earlier, there was an old retired minister named Stan McQueen. And, and what he did was he didn't speak to me. He gave me space. Um, to do my own thinking and my own reflection, uh, so he didn't he didn't unduly influence me because I probably would have because I admired him so much I would have listened to him and and forgone sort of what I needed to do for myself. So it, it's an interesting gift that he gave me of 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 not speaking, you know, of just creating that space for me to love it some stuff out. Right, um, my grandmother uh, on my dad's side was a, a big influence in my life. I, I think the uh, the chairman of of the board uh, for the company that I, I previously left, just by his leadership style, I learned a lot um, about what I would call is fair management, and and I don't define it the way a lot of employees do, which is what fair is what works for me. I'm, it, it's fair, meaning it's fair for the shareholders, it's fair for you know management, employees, and everyone involved. Um, there's a there's a charity I'm involved with right now in West Africa, in the Gambia, um, a woman runs it 
uh, founded it named Yasin Sar. She's one of the most strategic, loving, caring, smart, inspirational, you know, purpose-driven uh, people I've ever met in my life. Um, so she, she's, you know, in some way influences me. Um, I think, you know, you mentioned Jim Collins work. Um, I just finished reading uh, Bob Chapman's book, Everybody Matters. So Bob Chapman runs a multi-billion dollar uh, private company where, you know, they have this huge culture around uh, caring about people so that, you know, this isn't a, a little shop doing it right. This is, this is a big company that's done a lot of acquisitions. Um, so, you know, there's a variety of people in different ways from, from friends. And I, I guess it depends really, are you talking, you know, talking about more med- my meditative life? Are you talking about my business influences? Um, you know, um, they pop up in different ways. I love it. Well, and I, I think if all the listeners who are listening hear that, we can relate to that because there's different roles and identities we carry and there's probably different influences in those different areas. So yeah, there's a, there's a guy that I was thinking about recently. I don't know why Mr. Weatherby, he was like <laughs> Adam, Adam coach or something in hockey. And, and I think I was thinking about him because he since passed he was my mm-hmm. favorite coach. I don't think technically he was the, he was the best coach. Probably he didn't, you know, but he had fun with us. He was, he expected a lot from us. He, uh, he cared about us and you wanted to play for that guy, you know? Um, mm-hmm. So I was just reflecting on that. And I've had coaches, you know, who have all their credentials and whatnot. And, you know, I, I know there's times when you don't want to, you know, didn't want to play as hard for them. Right. So yeah. it's that, it's that other, it's that other piece. So, you know, profit fuels our companies for sure. Um, but people drive them and, um, and you need both. So let, let's stay on this point for a bit because, you know, obviously when we're out talking with people and going for business, Mm -hmm. one of the, I don't know, obstacles or challenges that people in our industry will face is, you know, people don't pay the bills, profits pay the bills. So, Mm -hmm. and that's an extreme example, Mm -hmm. but you know, it might be muted a little from that, but what do you say to people who discount this in advance of knowing what you know, because part of it is you're going in to help them learn this so they can supercharge performance versus, you know, this incremental bumps that they get by doing it the old mm-hmm. way. Yeah, my mind's spinning a little bit. I, there's a few things that kind of come to mind. One, one is just the nature of the question sort of sets up this either or, right? That, you know, you'll hear sales guys say, well, are we bring in the money, right? If it wasn't for us, it's true. And if it wasn't for the accountants, you'd be broken in jail, you know? If it wasn't for compliance, you, you know, they're there protecting you. So I don't know why we need to set it up that I'm a better than you, right? Or I'm more important um, by virtue of the roles that we each play. Um, I mean, team analogies, you know, you can talk about those all day, right? It, you know, uh, a backup goalie uh, may, may play very little, but when he does, um, he's really important you know, if the main guy goes down. So I don't know why we want to place these judgments on those things. Um, but, but one of the, one of the, one of the other pieces is um, when people say, you know, one of the hard ones is when you have successful people who've been doing it sort of the hard, this, you know, people are expendable growing through people. And I and just they're say, comfortable. and they're comfortable. Sure. And, and of course they are because they've had success that way. And I just say, imagine how successful you could have been. Um, you know, that's another, and, and it's also this idea that business is only about making money. And I don't think that's true. I think when we talk about uh, business, um, what are we, it's really, what are we trying to create in the world in terms of, yeah, profit for a company? Absolutely. Um, what's the impact we want to have? What's the product or service that we want to be delivering that adds, that adds value to our consumer or our target, target market? How are we going to do that responsibly? Um, if we actually think that it is only about profit, we're making a whole bunch of other choices um, about our impact and social responsibility and everything else. We may not articulate them, but, but we're clearly making, making that choice. 
And, and lastly, the thing is, look, I, I, I just kind of share that in, in my coaching and my work uh, with senior leaders or whoever it is. Not once have I asked a senior leader, you know, what their pain is or their biggest challenge. And they've said, you know, Jeff, I was up all night trying to figure out a pivot table in Excel. You know, <laughs> that's not what they're worried about, right? They're worried about engagement. They're worried about, uh, they're worried about loyalty. They're worried actually, you know, entrepreneurial businesses, a lot of times they're worried about the well-being of one of their employees' family or that his wife is going through cancer or whatever it is. It, it extends well beyond sort of these metrics and bottom lines. And I think we need to give permission to say we can do all this. In fact, we need all of this. And, um, and that's part of the expectation of what it means to be a good business person. And so one of the things I'll react to is, you know, when people will talk about, well, they're a business person, they're a good business person. And what they're saying is they grind people or they make a lot of money. And the majority of business people I know, um, they're not that um, myopic in their view of, of what they're doing. No. Yeah. Well, and people may start or spend some time in that zone, yeah. but they find that um, over time, it needs to be more than that. Otherwise, it, there's a void. It's at that soul level. Your soul is empty. So you get more stuff. You get more achievement. You get more accolades and sunshine blown up your butt. But yeah, it's never enough because there's this void because that purpose and meaningfulness isn't there. The lack of fulfillment, no matter how much you fill these other buckets, which in and of themselves are still important buckets, mm -hmm. but there's a void in behind it. So, yeah, yeah. And let me just say to that quickly that <clears throat> we also have to understand there's rhythms in business that, mm -hmm. that there's times when there's a lot of financial pressure and it, you know, we got to put our heads down and really figure that out. Um, we don't need to do it at the expense of people. Like we don't need to become kind of jerks through that. Um, but, but one of the things I talk a lot about in my work is the, is the um, survival mindset, right? What happens when we're under pressure? And, and quite frankly, when we're under pressure, it's a biological or neurological response. Um, we go into survival mode and into survival mode, others are either the enemy or food, right? I'm either gonna eat you up or I feel you're gonna get me. And now that's the way I look at my world. Um, we use that language in business, right? He's out to attack me or he attacked me in that meeting. It's, it's very survival oriented. And so part of it is helping people move through that to a place of, of what I would call uh, prosperity. Um, and it fits nicely. You know, the name of my organization, my company is called magnanimous and, uh, I know it's a hard word for a lot of people to spell, say, or whatever, but magnanimous literally from the Latin means great mind and soul. I talk about great, um, uh, great competence or high, highly great capacity as a business and great care and compassion. Or you could talk as an individual about great skill and great being, you know, that we need both. And, you know, you talked about people that have influenced me. I think for most of us, if we think about the, People in our lives that we think of as great people, they're not the people that have sort of just kind of driven through people and are hugely successful, maybe monetarily in other ways. <clears throat> they're people that are driven, successful, and have been giving, compassionate, caring, coaching, you know, clear, honest, even with tough feedback at times, but they've embodied kind of both of those things. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm going to ask the question. I don't want to assume anything or give my own commentary. What you're talking about there, is that the same as balance? Mm, I would prefer to call it integration. I like it. Right? Because I, I fear that balance is sort of this idea that as I go through my day, everything's kind of perfectly balanced and life's a lot messier than that, right? But <clears throat> I, I just say, I just prefer to call it integration. And so I think of it, if you look at my own path, sort of, the, you know, the church caring, purpose driven, then, and, and look, when I was a teenager, man, um, I was, I was reading Trump's books. I was, you know, I used to tell my brother, <laughs> I shouldn't even say this. I used to tell my brother, you know, when he was married and had kids, I was going to hire him and then fire him. 
right? Like, yeah, Wall Street was a favorite movie of mine. Like, let's buy a company and hey, I've been there and break it up. So yeah. it's actually a good thing I didn't go into business at that time in my life, honestly. Um, and, and then there's this business side. So the, the, the thing is, I think we're always trying to integrate these different facets of ourselves. And in business, the magic is when we can do that. You know, um, managers will often talk about what's fair and what's right, what's right, wrong, black and white. And I say, look, if, if management was that, there's algorithms. We, I'm sure we can do design for that, right? Or if it's as simple right. as what does a policy book say, I don't need a manager to do that. Manager Managing is the art of what you've just raised, which is balancing shareholder needs and customer needs and, and, and profit and all that stuff with care and compassion and fairness and engaging employees and setting high expectations and inviting people to those. That That's the art of leadership. Right. And I love the integration piece because I got told something early on that related to this idea of balance. And uh, if we think of what the definitional word of balance means, it means, you know, sides being equal. Mm -hmm. Right. And if I use, I'm going to Sheldon Cooper for a sec. So if this is a balance, right, this thing in the middle is the fulcrum. Yeah. Right. If the weight on the left side and the right side is equal, it's in balance. Right. But the reality is lives are too dynamic. And what mm-hmm. happens is, you know, if we use just work life, you right. know, this work life balance, the word choice that people throw out a topic for maybe our next podcast. Yeah. But so if we're doing that, um, there's going to be times where maybe a family member's sick or a terminally ill parent or something like that, where the weight of that weighs more. And, you know, there's going to be times like year end or, you know, mm-hmm. in companies or businesses where work will take a greater weight. And what we have to do is shift our focus at those times where it's needed to be able to integrate the many facets. So when the weight shifts over here, we have to shift. If we change this from the F word fulcrum to focus over there, um, again, simple physics says if there's more weight over here, if you shift the fulcrum there, it'll balance. Right. Yet when the weight comes off, you have to come back. Right. Mm -hmm. And just being able to be dynamic because our lives are so dynamic. And I love that idea of integration. I haven't heard it that way, but that's a great analogy, Jeff. And and I want to draw back uh, and thank you for sharing it that way because (laughs) we're actually generally in business okay if we're out of balance doing year-end stuff. But we have little patience for when we're out of balance, if we use that same sort of, um, you know, language that you when it's, when it's people oriented stuff. And, you know, sometimes um, as a manager or leader, you maybe you do have to put in some time with an employee and really sit down and slog it out and help them, you know, mm-hmm. or maybe somebody does need an extra, an extra day or time off or something. And then we get into, Oh, but then they'll take advantage in this, that, and the other thing. I don't think so. Not if you're, not if you're really clear about your expectations and, and, and the, the accountabilities are built in, built in space or built into the, the space that, that you're working. And, and so I never want to confuse people with the idea that if you're caring and compassionate, that means we show up to work and we, we sing Kumbaya in the morning and hold hands in the afternoon. Um, no, um, no, you know, I, I think in, in what I present and, and in our work, it's, it's actually the opposite. Very clear about the results that you're supposed to be delivering. In fact, one of those results is also towards how you you grow and develop your people or how you help your coworkers. Mm-hmm. So when, when is, you know, you're in an interview, right? And you get your, all your classic questions, but nobody asks, when's the time a colleague was in trouble and you demonstrated compassion? When is the time you noticed a team or, or a colleague that was really frustrated with a project or deadline and you offered to help and gave them extra resources? When, like, we don't ask those questions. And so, I think we like the idea of it, but there's this, well, I'm busy, um, metrics focused, and I'm all about the, the profit. And we put on this tough exterior, um, you know, going to battle and all the images we use. And it's, 
inside and at home, we're, we're completely the other way. Let me, let me say this too, Corey. As much as we talk about um, home life, work life, here, here's the other thing that I notice. It also goes the other way, which is when we're in organizations that are very um, just, I don't even want to say results driven, just, just driven, okay? And it's just go, go, go. And, you know, we have to prove our return on our investment and clock every eight minutes and whatnot. A lot of times we take that back into our personal lives, right? So now you're at the dinner table with your kids saying, well, what's the return on the investment I made today with the 20 minutes I spent on your homework last night? Um, do you know what I mean? Like that mindset, because we're, we're, we're in it all day. It's what we're being taught and told at work. We now then take back into our, our family lives and relationships and they become sort of functions and roles to us as well. And it has detrimental effects. So um, one goes where the other one goes, right? We all know that if, uh, if I've had a rough day at work, you know, it's common that you come home and, you know, you might be a little rougher at home than you want to be in terms of how you're even thinking about people. So, Right. I've heard it referred to as you don't want to be going home and using those you love the most as your lightning rod all the time. Yeah. And so then why do we need lightning rods? There's a problem at work, right? So yeah, got to figure that out. Exactly. Well, I love it. So <clears throat> you're out there, you're, training, teaching, consulting people on all of this, you know, the little I've gotten to know you, I know that you walk the talk on this. So what are some of the things that you do in your own life and business that incorporate these principles that you want others to embrace? Hmm. So if we're, yeah, if we're talking about habits, I guess, or, 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 or whatnot in terms of kind of trying to live this in a workplace, there's a few questions. First of all, um, we need to ask or reverse the impact question. So what that means is we're, we're pretty good at, um, at knowing how other people affect us, right? Ah, oh, man, I, when I work with Corey on projects, he's always late or rah, 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 right? We, we often complain about others. But we don't usually say, what's it like for them to work with me? Hmm. Right? When I'm frustrated or I'm up against a deadline, what's that like for my coworkers? Hmm. What's it like for my employee or my team member when I'm always giving them last minute information? Right? How does that kind of screw them up? What about my assistant who everything I give her is last minute? What, you know, so we need to reverse it and, and say, if I had the magic video camera on, that, on, on my work life, and could sit back and watch it, it could be, you know, I guess it would be a uh, half hour comedy, right? What do I, what do I see? What would I witness? And I can guarantee you, it's usually not the story we've created in our head. Right. right. I, I don't, I don't have managers tell me that, you know, you know, Jeff, um, I don't really have an open door policy. It's, it's pretty closed most of the time, but open for my favorites. Right. Oh, I'm fair with some, but not everybody, you know, I never hear that, right? We're all solution focused, open door, blah, blah, blah. So we create a story that's just not true. But, but the other, the other uh, piece besides the impact piece for me is to try to, uh, I think, develop a mind of curiosity. Um, and that leads to suspending judgment. And I'm sure your listeners have fallen into this and maybe you have, I certainly have when as a manager you hear a piece of information and you believe it and you believe that first piece of information, you're like, what? Oh, I asked him to do that. And you, if you dig in, you know, there's, you know, a few sides to the story, so to speak. And so if you can have a, a, a kind of a characteristic of curiosity, I think it just suspends judgment. It's like, really, Corey, I, I never would have thought of that way. Tell me more. You know, you're in a much more exploratory space. Um, so, you know, that this this will be a Sheldon moment for you, I guess. Is I like to think of uh, Star Trek, and I like Captain Picard, right? And you know when they're sitting on the bridge and they look out in, in the big window out into space, you know they're sitting side by side and they they don't know where they're going and and they just say engage, right? And whoosh, ship goes off, and that's how I like to think about it. Is we're just going to go discover this, right? We're, if it's a problem, the result we're after, a challenge with an employee, let's just go be curious about it and see what we discover. And that keeps us away from a lot of defensive behavior, uh, blame, 
conflict uh, office politics. So those would be a couple of things that I try to be mindful of. Those are fantastic. And what I really like and appreciate about them, Jeff, is they aren't the typical ones. Like we, you know, and I'm sure, you know, when we get to our 500th episode, there's going to be a lot of repetition of different ones and yours stands out and is very unique. And I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. And, you know, you can tell when someone's saying something to um, just say something. And then when it's very natural part of their being, and I can see it's definitely part of your being. I appreciate that. What, what I'd like us to end with in the, listeners here to get a deeper perspective into you know you as a person if we're looking at or if you're looking at you know towards the end of your life and it's your 100th birthday celebration who do you want there at your 100th birthday celebration and what would you want people saying about you Mm. well it's good if I get to 100 right and uh, and I can know who's around me that's 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 awesome well i mean i i you know without sounding too tried i think obviously i would want the people that are closest to me right so uh my wife and and i have two daughters and um you know close friends um but but what i want them to say about me um is that they felt uh, deeply loved by for who they are so without my expectations, but, but really sort of loved, encouraged, um, uh, and celebrated even um, who they were created to be, you know? And I think that's just the quintessential human struggle is to just accept the uniqueness of who we are, uh, embrace that, and then offer that to the world um, because, you know, that, that will bring a lot of value to the world. And instead we you know, we struggle with those questions around identity for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, and that's the big thing I want. I, I think, I think that's sort of what I, my mission is, you know, underneath everything else is that, that people would do that for themselves and then offer that to others. So I think the world can be a mean, harsh, crappy, judgmental place a lot of the times. And I think that's a direct reflection of our own inability uh, to just accept the uniqueness of who we are and not compare it to others. Um, and, and so then, then we just accept who they are. Right. And so it's a little bit like what I said with the curiosity and at work, when I, when I'm at work, I can easily get into to a mode of, you know, well, they're the finance department and they're being a pain in the, in the butt and they're not doing this, not doing that. Yeah. Some of that might be true, but there, there are also people that might be have a frustrating day that have two kids at home that, that are waiting for them and they have a soccer game they're going to tonight. And actually, they probably want to do a good job at work just like you do. Um, and so if I have frustrations at work, it's only fair to assume others do. Right? If I care about family totally and being successful, it's only when I assume others are the same. And so let's remove some of that, um, that judgment. And... And Corey, I think what we've done is we've we've okayed that in the workplace by calling it uh, personality differences, mm. uh, po- office politics, um, the nature of the industry, or the type of customer. Those are just all BS justifications for saying I'm not going to see them in the fullness of who they are. And, good uh, on you for having a good filter like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, but that was masterful. I, we, we myself all, and some others may not have had that great restraint. So. Oh, and we all have our moments, right? And uh, but, but what we have to recognize, right, is when we allow those moments to continually define us, that's mm-hmm. the identity we've now created. Bingo. And that's how we become known, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love it. I, and I really appreciate the time you set aside today and hop nation. I hope you've enjoyed the time and the great insights from, you know, what I love about the way you speak and the concepts that you portray Jeff is there's a simplicity to it, Mm -hmm. which makes it easy to take action and do something with, but there's a great deal of depth Mm -hmm. and meaning behind it. 
And to be able to balance simplicity with depth is uh, an art and a science. And you combine that and live it out and really appreciate you, your time and the great insights. Looking forward to you and your continued success and staying in contact and um, growing together. I, and I apologize when you were speaking a couple of times, I had some shivers. It's, you know, us living here in Canada from time to time, it could get cold. And I took, I was wearing a quilted vest over top and <laughs> I asked this part, I said, should I take the vest off for the show? He says, yeah, probably. Uh, yeah. I, I didn't notice. I'm, I'm trying to manage where I'm looking in the screens of you over here in a camera. So, um, yeah. Well, for the listeners, if you, if you thought I was having a seizure or something, no, I was just kind of shivering. <laughs> so, <laughs> my apologies but oh, thank you very much Jeff thank you for the time and thank you listeners and Hop Nation for tuning in look forward to seeing you next time, time.